morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel in Lindivo 30. I'm Pastor Ruben. Thank you for joining us today. We're streaming live on Facebook on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays at 9 a.m. You can join us or check out the videos uh, afterwards on those days. If you're in the neighborhood, we'd love to have you come by and join us as we are live here at the church at 5383 Martin Street. So you're more than welcome. Today, if you'll grab your Bibles, we will be in the last chapter of 2 Thessalonians, chapter 3. Good morning, Diana. Glad you're watching today. Continue prayers for your move. We're in 2 Thessalonians, chapter 3. Uh, we have a short chapter. But let me just ask you a quick question. It was asked of me yesterday as you're getting your Bible and as you're turning there, hopefully your cup of coffee. Good morning, Robert. Uh, why, why were the epistles written? <laughs> why were the epistles written? Why, why was the book of Acts, Romans, Corinthians, you know, go down the, the real Ephesians, Galatians, you know, Thessalonians, Timothy, Peter, why were they written? What was the reason for Paul, John, and Peter, James writing these epistles. If you answered because there were problems in the church, then you hit the nail right on the head. <laughs> That's exactly right why the epistles were written. And so why do we have them now in the word of God? Because there's still problems in the church and there will never be a day when there are no problems in the church and the church needs to be uh, corrected. And so we get to read through these things and correct um, correct the things today in the now and existing presence uh, that we live in as we struggle to um, glorify our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And in this chapter here, chapter 3, uh, we're going to see that there's some major problems in the church. And you can almost see some of this stuff in the church today. In fact, if you are in a big enough church, you'll probably see some of these things taking place in church, individuals who come in and and disrupt the church. Um, you'll always have those individuals that, that will come into the church and disrupt it. So, good morning, Allie. Glad you could join us. Let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll get started. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your grace and mercies. Thank you for bringing us here this morning, Lord. May you just minister to our hearts and spirit, and help us to understand, Lord, <clears throat> that these letters were written to the church to correct the church in its errors, and Lord, that we can learn from these things, that God wants us to reflect uh, his son, Jesus Christ, in a righteous way. In a way, Lord, that would uh, reflect to the world that we are a church that loves the Lord. We are a church that loves one another. And we want to reflect that very clearly. We don't want to mislead people, uh, Father, and especially by our own self, Lord. And so, Father, minister to us and help us to have an understanding of why Paul would say these things. And, and how can we even do these things? Uh, in our own flesh, we can't, but through the Spirit of God, we can, and there's a purpose for these things. Uh, my dad used to discipline me, Lord, and, and his discipline was for a reason, and it was to correct me, and Lord, it kept me in line. I didn't want to get disciplined by my father, especially uh, when he would uh, use a belt to whip me with. Um, I wanted to make sure that I did not uh, find that belt of understanding to my to my body um, and so there is there is reason for correction and for discipline and it does help us to stay on the straight and narrow path and so minister to us now we pray in jesus name amen amen good morning christina glad you could join us second thessalonians chapter three once again so paul is going to close the letter to the second th to the thessalonians here in second thessalonians and he says finally those are a pastor's final words when he says, finally, to end, and then he goes off for 15 more minutes. Well, Paul's going to finish up in 18 verses. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified just as it is with you, and that we may be delivered from the unreasonable and wicked men, for not all have faith. So Paul ends with the prayer request that they would pray that the word of God would have free course, that it would accomplish what God wanted it to accomplish. 
Now, understand this about the Word of God. It is God's Word, and God is using it for His glory through His Holy Spirit that empowers the Word of God. And so we are just the vessels uh, to share the Word of God, and we allow the Spirit then to take those words of truth and do with it as He sees fit. And the Bible says that the Word of God does not return void. It will accomplish what God desires it to accomplish. We are just the messenger. We're just the voice in the wilderness, in a sense. I kind of picture it like um, today, you know, you can read books or you can read audiobooks or listen to audiobooks. Uh, so, so either the author or they'll hire somebody to read their book and put it on audio form. And then you can listen to it on your phone or a cassette, if you still have those, or a CD. <clears throat> that person that is reading that book is just the reader. He's just the messenger. He's just reading the words from those pages out to the audience. And it is the words on those pages that will minister to the audience and not that man himself. And so I kind of liken us to that. Uh, I know we have a heart and we have a passion and we want to see people accept uh, the word of the Lord as his word. We want to see people, people accept Jesus Christ. We want to see them change. But guys, that's, that's really not up to us. That's up to God. And we just have to trust God that he will do that. I know that in my own life, God had to change me. No one else could change me. Oh boy, a lot of people tried. A lot of people gave me advice. But ultimately, it had to be God who opened up my eyes and opened up my heart to receive him as my savior, and he did a wonderful job. So Paul's request was that the word would, would have free course and glorify God to do what it was supposed to, but also to be delivered uh, from unreasonable and wicked men, for not all have faith. Now, this is in the church. Uh, obviously, Paul is not in Thessalonica. He's writing to them. He's somewhere else, and I, if I remember correctly, uh, I thought it was Rome. Uh, or Corinth. So he's in Corinth and he's being persecuted there in Corinth by unreasonable. Uh, that word unreasonable is an interesting word uh, because it describes the person that he's having a problem with, who's a wicked person. He's an unreasonable person. He's not able to think reasonably, logically. Uh, when you speak with unreasonable people, they speak with unreasonable uh, uh, responses and you just kind of scratch your head like that that makes no sense at all that's so unreasonable and there's really no way of getting through to those people um, and so Paul says just just pray that God would deliver me from these people uh, because they don't have the true faith but the Lord is faithful who will establish you and guard you from the evil one and that is true God is faithful and we need to constantly rem be reminded of that that when the enemy attacks us when we're going through things that god is faithful and he'll get us through uh, those situations he'll establish us and guard us uh, from the enemy the enemy wants to destroy us god wants to uh, uh, help us to be successful in this life and we have confidence in the lord concerning you both that you will do and will do the things we command you now here paul is is suggesting that they do certain things, and he suggested it throughout the writings here, as a command. Now, this command is a command of love, and it's not a command in the sense of a, 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 of a dictatorship, but it's a command that we get these commandments from the Lord himself, and so we command you uh, to do these things, and we know that you'll do those things. We're confident that you'll do those things. And why is that? Because they have the Spirit of God in them. And as the Spirit of God ministers to all men the truth of God, we will be willing to hear that truth and be obedient to those commands. Now, may the Lord direct your heart into the love of God and into the patience of Christ. So may he touch our hearts and fill us with the love of God and the patience of Christ. <clears throat> now he gets into the nitty-gritty here, uh, verse 6 and on. Um, talking about these unreasonable men, uh, these evil men uh, back in chapter 2 who uh, shake and trouble the minds of believers by spirit, by word, and even by letters, 
who try to disrupt the church. Uh, these men are in the church. They're a part of the church. They serve in the church at times, and they have pretense. Um, had a guy here, just to give you an example, years ago came out of a Bible college uh, with all this knowledge, and he thought he knew everything. Um, a lot of pride in his life, and so he went around telling everybody uh, all the bad things that were going on in the church because he knew how to do the right things and the church didn't know how to do the right things. And um, he pretty much made a fool of himself because he didn't know uh, anything really. He thought he knew accounting, he thought he knew how it worked, but the reality was he didn't. And when it was explained to him, he didn't have anything to say, but the damage was already done. He destroyed the church, divided it, and so forth. Uh, these are those men that come in and they're just unreasonable. Even after it was explained to him, you know, uh, the question was asked, now turn around and repent and do the right thing by telling everybody that you were wrong. And of course he couldn't do that. Uh, wasn't reasonable, couldn't think. And I believe did not have faith in the Lord. There was another motive behind all of that. And so you have guys like this that come into the church. What do you do? <clears throat> Verse six. And, but we command, we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. Now, that is an interesting verse. I thought God was love. I thought God doesn't want us to judge one another. And yet here Paul, in a life, in a real life situation, is saying, look, there are men and women who walk disorderly, who don't keep the commandments of the Lord, and they won't keep them. They probably have been corrected many times, but they won't listen. And Paul is saying, stop having fellowship with them. Withdraw from them. The word withdraw means keep away or even avoid them. The word disorderly here means ill regularly. It means contrary from prescribed order. And so this person is disorderly in that he knows the commandments of the Lord. He knows what he should do, but he doesn't do them. He walks disorderly. Now, then this is the question. We're all sinners, right? We're all sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God. We recognize that. And as sinners, our heart really is to be appreciative of what God has done for us through sending his son, Jesus Christ, and dying on the cross. And, and we love that. But unfortunately, we still have our sinful nature. God has given us eternal life because we believe in the work of Jesus Christ. But we still have our unrighteousness that dwells in these fleshly bodies. Our spirit hates it. Our spirit doesn't want what our bodies want, but yet our bodies crave for these things, whether it's pride, or arrogance, um, you know, whatever that is, disorderly conduct, it's the flesh of our bodies. And unfortunately, our flesh is with us. But as believers, we have to really bring our bodies under subjection to the Lord. Personally, we have to look at ourselves first. And we have to ask ourselves, am I walking disorderly? Am I not keeping the traditions of the Lord? And if we are trying with our hearts to do so, then we should encourage others to do the same. And if others are not, then we lovingly try to correct them. And if they continue to not listen, then it's time for them to leave. Um, again, every church experiences this. We've experienced it many times in our church, and I'm sure that other churches have experienced too, where where people come in. We had a young man um, sharing a bunch of lies about Virginia and I, um, and they were lies. And instead of people coming to us and asking us if these things were true, and of course this young man, 16 years old, they believed him. And so it caused so much trouble. And so we had to, <laughs> first time in history where we literally had to ask somebody to leave. I really hated to ask people to leave. Uh, I didn't want to do that. Uh, it's not my heart to ask anyone to leave the church, but it was at a point where it was just constantly disordered. 
where everything was being questioned. Even my teaching from the pulpit, someone came up to me and says, do you know that you offended that person because of what you said from the pulpit? And I'm like, what? And so I, I, I like, now I'm in the mode of, of defense. And so I went to that person and, and said, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to offend you. I'm just trying to teach what the word of God is saying. And they looked at me like, I'm not offended. So it, it just caused so, so much disorderly that people were so sensitive that you know, people had to just leave. And so I ended up having to ask a whole family to just leave the church, go somewhere else, start afresh and, and you work over there and hopefully you, you know, you've learned your lesson. But <clears throat> unless there's repentance, um, and it's sad, it's sad. I'm, it, it's hard for me to even say these things right now because it's sad that you have to actually uh, keep away or avoid someone because they're just, disorderly people he goes on and says for you yourselves know how you ought to follow us and paul is talking about himself as he's following christ for you for we were not disorderly among you paul's saying we weren't disorderly nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge but worked with labor and toil night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you not because we do not have authority but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. Now, you, you have to ask the question. I'm sure you were asking that question. What was the disorderly function? What were they doing that was so disorderly? I mean, it has to be horrific. It had to be pretty bad. But Paul is saying here, all it was is that they were going around asking everybody for food, asking everybody for free things. They weren't working. They weren't attempting to work. They were just asking for handouts. And Paul says, no, we didn't do that. We weren't disorderly in that we worked. Even the Apostle Paul said he worked. He would build tents instead of taking money. And he goes on even more and gives us more definitions of this disorderly function. For even when we were with you, we command, commanded you this. If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. And so these guys were in the church and they were going to everybody. Oh, you know. Um, I, I don't have this or I don't have that. And, you know, and then the person, well, how about if I get you that? Oh, okay, thank you. Appreciate that. And then they go to the next person and the next person. And, you know, and they're not really doing anything. They're not doing nothing. They're not helping the church. They're not serving in church. They're not participating. All they're doing really is, is, is fattening up themselves. And Paul says, look, if they don't work, they don't eat. And there's a point where, where, you as an individual, as you're listening to people like this, you just say, well, praise God, we'll pray for you because God can provide. Because you see it happening in their life. You see it happening with others. And so there's a point where you just say, we'll pray for you. And they'll get the hint that, okay, I don't ask them anymore. I'll go to the next guy, <laughs> you know, or hopefully they'll, they'll realize, no, you know, I just need to pray to the Lord and, and ask him and he'll hear my prayers. But also listen to what they were doing. For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. So all these disorderly functions, um, not working, and now busybodies. A busybody is someone who's just in everyone's business, right? That's what we usually say when people come and ask. My granddaughters will always say, Poppy, what are you doing? I'm like, you're in my business. And they start laughing, you know, because we know that phrase, you're in my business. And they just stop laughing. Oh, stop it, Poppy. I just want to know how are you doing? You know, well, you're in my business. Don't, don't talk to me right now. But we always use that phrase. Well, these guys were always in everyone's business, going around trying to figure out what's going on with that person and this person and that person. And they were gossiping and tail bearing and doing all those things that they feel that they should do because they can be a help. They can correct you know, or they can get rid of someone that's not doing what they should be doing. Um, not good. Now, those who are such, we commend and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. So here's the encouragement to those who do this. Look, just find a job and work and eat your own bread. Take care of your own needs. There's nothing wrong with that. Now, that does, he's not saying that we shouldn't feed the poor. We shouldn't help out because we should. But there's, a, there's those people that just go overboard with those things. But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. Um, again, these people weren't doing really anything good at all. Um, 
<clears throat> there are people in the church that <clears throat> are serving in the church. You know, I was thinking about this, this this morning when I woke up. I was talking to the Lord and just thinking about the brazen altar we're going to share tonight in Exodus 20, 21, I believe it is. <clears throat> or 27, I'm sorry. <clears throat> brazen altar and how the children of Israel, when they went into the tabernacle, that was the first thing they saw was the brazen altar. And, and, and immediately as you see that brazen altar, you're thinking, oh, sacrifice. I, got, I need a sacrifice to give to the Lord so that I am right with the Lord. You know, I, I got to be right with the Lord. Uh, otherwise, I can't approach the Lord. Otherwise, I won't be able to do the things that I'd like to do for the Lord. <clears throat> And yet there are those who will walk in and they'll see that brazen altar and they'll ignore it completely. And all they're thinking of, what can I get from the Lord? How can I get someone to give me something and not being willing to do good? And Paul was encouraging him, look, you just be faithful, do good. Don't get weary of doing good. Don't stop from doing good. I, I don't understand people who who get injured, for instance, and they're on disability, and they're home all day long, and they're trying to work out their disability, their, their workman comp, and just various things like this. And they're watching TV, or they're even reading, and that's fine, reading is good, better than watching TV. But in my mind, I'm thinking, go to church. Go do something at church. Get involved in the Lord's work. We have so much administration here that you could get involved and take care of all the books and take care of all that administration stuff if you're not doing anything at home. Or I never understand if you're retired. Um, I just read an article about Riverside County uh, police officer who retired, and three days later he died in that retirement. Edison, when I worked for Edison, there was a guy that um, I would talk to quite oft often up in Arrowhead old guy he was like in his 70s and I'm like dude you got to retire he goes oh no 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 I'm not gonna retire the day I retire is the day I die he realized that having that job kept him alive and I would keep encouraging no you got to retire he wouldn't retire statistically people who retired from Edison within five years they were dead and that's crazy I, I don't understand that because I have a church here, and if I retire, I'll go work in that church. I would just show up and say, hey, pastor, you know, I'm retired. I don't got anything to do. What do you want me to do? Wow. Well, you want to clean some windows today? Yeah, let's clean some windows today. You want to clean the baseboards? Yeah, let's clean the baseboards. You want to, you want to vacuum? Yeah, let's vacuum. You know, you, you want to do some administration, some filing? Yeah, let's me do some filing. How about cutting the yard? How about pulling some weeds? How about thinning out this? How about doing that? You know, I don't, I don't understand that. You work in the kingdom of God and you're doing God's work for his glory. I know a brother who has a church and he has a lot of the board members and leadership. They're all retired men and they all have their pensions. They all do very well and that's what they do. They help him run that church. And they free him up to study all day long, to teach at Bible colleges and, and so forth, so that he doesn't have to worry about any administration, worry about any of the church building, all of that stuff. He just studies. And I thought, wow. And a lot of these guys that he has, it's funny, they're, they're, they work for Edison. They are ex-Edison employees. And I thought that was interesting. Don't grow weary of doing good. Don't go weary of doing good. The day I retire, in fact, I'm not going to retire because I have no retirement. <laughs> it's gone. I will, be, I will be serving the Lord until I die. You know, um, And even if the Lord decides to take me out of this ministry, I will be serving somewhere. I have to. I have to. It's in my blood. God can't keep me from doing something like the things that I love doing. So, so don't grow weary of doing good. Keep doing it. And if anyone does not obey the word, in this epistle, note that person and do not keep company with him that he may be ashamed. Uh, isn't that interesting? Note him. Pull out your iPhone and little iPad and put his name down and say, this guy, keep an eye on him. It's how sad, huh? That, that someone has to keep an eye on you because you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. 
I hate that. I really do. That's a part of ministry I hate, having to deal with people that won't do what they're called to do. It makes no sense to me. I don't, they should be doing what they're called to do, and then I've got to go in there, and then they get upset at me. It's like, come on. You know what you need to do. Do it. Note that person. And then he says, and do not keep company with him that he may be ashamed. Now, the, the ashamed is supposed to, supposed to move him to come back and get right. You know, you stop having fellowship with someone. Try, you know, stop having fellowship with a relative that you have had fellowship most of your life and they call themselves a Christian and they're living in sin and now stop having fellowship with him. That affects them. And you tell them, this is why we're, we're not having fellowship with you. And, and immediately they'll get mad and upset. But then they start looking at their lives. Well, they're right. I'm not living the way I'm supposed to be living. And then they come back and they say, I need, I'm going to correct it because I miss you guys. I want to have fellowship. And that's what it's supposed to do. And yet do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. And so this should be done out of love, out of compassion, and out, of, out to restore him. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace always and every day, in every way, the Lord be with you all. The salutation of Paul with my own hands, which is a sign in every epistle. So I write, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. This is a hard, hard chapter, but I encourage you, those of you that are upset at others because they're trying to get you to serve or, or motivate you to do what you're supposed to be doing, I encourage you to read that chapter over again and over again and to ask yourself, am I doing what I should be doing? Then why am I so angry? Why am I so upset? And find out the real reason that you're struggling inside. And get right with the Lord, because the Lord loves you. He cares about you, and he has a work for you. And it's never too late to return to the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, for your grace. Your grace is amazing, Lord, especially for the body of Christ, Lord. There's so much of it, Lord, for us. But we must humble ourselves, Lord. Humble ourselves, Lord. And not get angry and pride but humble ourselves. As John the Baptist said, I or he must continually increase in my life and I must choose to continually decrease in my life. Help us, Lord, to decrease that he may increase. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you for viewing our Devo 30. Please share this uh, Devo. Uh, you never know who might be listening to it and might be touched by the word of God. God bless you. We'll see you Friday.